Welcome to the Metro Cinema 40th anniversary screening of David Lynch's Eraserhead. Uh, thank you to uh, Shinoa and Alison from the New Musical, uh, New Music Edmonton for a wonderful performance. And thank you very much for coming uh, to the opening night of our Dream Logic David Lynch retrospective. Uh, so my name is Owen Armstrong and I'm a projectionist here at the Metro Cinema and uh, I was asked to do an introduction to Eraserhead because as it happens I wrote my thesis on it and uh, it's very probably my favourite film. It has, however, been around 15 years since I've had to access the part of my brain that thinks about film criticism uh, with any kind of fluidity or authority, so forgive me if I sound a bit rusty. So the pictures you see here uh, are a collection of stills, set photography, and I think also a few shots of ideas that didn't uh, quite make the final cut. But a few of the faces you'll see in there are David Lynch, uh, Catherine Coulson, who worked as assistant to the director, also assistant camera operator, and who would uh, also appear later in Twin Peaks as Margaret Lanterman, the log lady. Uh, Jack Nance, who plays Henry, who is married to Catherine Coulson and would go on to work with Lynch a number of times, notably in Blue Velvet and Twin Peaks. Uh, sound designer Alan Splett, who would also work on Dune and Blue Velvet. Fred Elms, who did lighting and special effects photography for the film, and later worked on a couple more with Lynch, as well as storytelling, Synecdoche, New York, and a few with Jim Jarmusch including Night on Earth, Coffee and Cigarettes, and Patterson, which we showed here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there are others in there too, uh, but I think those are the most frequently appearing members of the Eraserhead family. I'll give you just a little background on the film before focusing on my own interpretation of it. It took roughly five years to make, although perceptions of time appear to be a little hazy where the actual production is concerned. It was largely shot in a virtually abandoned building owned by the American Film Institute known as The Stables, and there's a couple of exterior shots of that in the slides too. Uh, for around two or three years, David Lynch lived in the stables and occupied Henry's room while he was there. When he eventually ran out of money to make the film, the cast and crew continued free of charge, even bringing film stock they'd purchased with their own money to the set so they could continue shooting. They worked day and night to ensure the film was completed before the stables were turned into an editing facility by the AFI. So from this you can kind of get the sense that while it may aesthetically be a strange and dark film, and perhaps even a little inaccessible to some, it was nothing short of a labour of love for everyone that worked together uh, far longer than they ever could have imagined they would have when they initially embarked on what was supposed to be a student film. Um, it's fair to say that it changed the lives of everyone involved and from my money the landscape of cinema too. It found a home on the midnight movie circuit, eventually generating a huge cult following and ended up on some theatre marquees for something like four years. Uh, it's considered to be the last of the real midnight movies after which it became nigh on impossible uh, to market films, uh, to market and screen films in the same way. Along with its midnight movie peers, El Topo, Night of the Living Dead, Rocky Horror Picture Show, Pink Flamingos, and The Harder They Come, Eraserhead was a key component in changing the way people viewed and critiqued what would previously have only ever existed on the fringes of cinema. It may be somewhat recognizable as experimental, surrealist art house film. It's certainly embedded within that canon of cinema owing to its initial journey into the vein of film theory and criticism, but it's also a deeply concise film, painstakingly sculpted into an audiovisual manifestation of the director's ideas and influences. Lynch is also an accomplished painter and photographer, and one of the most beautiful aspects of a Razorhead is his understanding of light and dark, or chiaroscuro to use its painterly term. There are what seem like areas of deep darkness throughout the film, and this is a very direct invitation for you to peer into those areas, encouraging you to imagine what it is that's been obscured from you. Sometimes only the slightest indication of an object or figure is revealed, and this delicate attention to detail is testament to the exacting, fastidious nature of the way in which Lynch is communicating with us. Though I'm a keen advocate of 35mm film, it's actually a real pleasure to be screening a Razorhead on a brand new digital print so as to enjoy these minute details with the best clarity currently at our disposal. It kind of amazes me that what people seem to remember with more frequency than anything else about the film is the nondescript, nondescript fetus. And the reason I find it odd is, uh, if you haven't seen it, you'll get it when you see it, don't worry. Uh, the reason I find it odd is that there is so much occurring in the universe of Eraserhead that for me, it's really the beginning of Lynch establishing a dialogue with us, the viewer, and one that would carry on throughout almost his entire body of work. Eraserhead is such a dense and unique exercise in creativity and technique that I eventually ended up basing my entire thesis on one single scene from the film. Those of you that have seen it will know what I'm referring to if I say the lady in the radiator. Those of you that haven't, you will soon enough. To be slightly more specific than that, I focused on the sound design in this scene as an exemplar of the ways in which Lynch uses his artistic dexterity to engage us in an open discourse with the world he has created. 
It was the first time I had experienced a piece of art that had attempted to document something beyond what is immediately visible and to dissect the complex arrangements of noise that clash and harmonize in an endless choir of exchange. Just to give you a brief idea of the technical components involved in sculpting the soundscape of a Razorhead, Lynch worked with sound designer Alan Splett in a small garage studio using two or three tape recorders and a console. They had a couple sound libraries for organic effects. The sounds are all natural, so no synthesizers. And the two would manipulate it with a graphic equalizer, some reverb, and a little, little dipper filter. They would vary the pitch, but not the speed of what they had made, and otherwise were able to piece it all together according to their own creative design. It took several months to make, and six, to, six months to a year to edit together, and is often cited as a precursor to a new genre of music at the time, what we may commonly refer to now as dark ambient or ambient industrial, although uh, elements of it can be found earlier in works by musicians like Tangerine Dream, Popol Vuh, and Throbbing Gristle. Where Eraserhead departs from common modes of sound design is that there is no definitive line between the temporal space of the film and anything that occurs outside of it. What we're hearing is the world that surrounds and flows through the images we're seeing, like a fractal study of sound inside a never-ending vortex of frequencies. This examination of both diegetic and non-diegetic sound is a prevalent theme in all of Lynch's work, whether it's the rising wash of white noise that emanates from a television set or the fractured tick of a broken light bulb, there is always a sense that the veil of reality that grounds us in the physical world is being broken, even if only temporarily. Although the same can be said for the visual element of the film, in fact very few films are able to so effectively blur those boundaries, I found that hearing a razor head had truly changed the way I would then hear the world around me. While not necessary to his detriment, Eraserhead is far and away Lynch's most direct exploration of these ideas, but he has continued to allude to a world beyond that which we physically engage with. Lynch is also a practitioner of transcendental meditation, having started in 1973 and eventually forming the David Lynch Foundation for Consciousness-Based Education and World Peace. He maintains that a large part of his creative process is being able to channel his ideas in a very direct, fluid, and conscious manner, and I hope some of you uh, saw earlier uh, in the film The Art Life, it's very evident that he exists in a constant state of communication with this raw, unfiltered and immediate part of himself. Rather than showing us a collection of interpreted and organized ideas, it's though a razor head is an open portal through which we see the other side for the first time, exactly as it is. It's often said of a razor head that it is a film to be experienced rather than watched, and this was certainly the case for me when I entered this unique world for the first time. While the film is definitely held together by at least the trace of a formal narrative, what we're really seeing is an explosion of ideas from the fabric and nature of existence. It's everything that lives beneath the veneer of reality, that we can't see or touch, but is within us and all around us, like the incorporeal mechanics of life. And with that, I'll leave you to experience it for yourself. Thank you very much.